Brazil hosts the summit of the New World Giants. Brazil. Brazil, Russia, India and China have a fundamental role to play. Their BRICS summit promised even more cooperation in the future. This meeting was extremely beneficial. Russia has benefited from our participation in the BRIC group. Setting an independent path. In a way, we are new kids on the block. And embracing the East. Today you have the Peking consensus. From the futuristic capital of Brasilia to the economic capital of South America and onto the beaches and favelas of Rio, we ask what brings these divergent superpowers together and what does the future hold for Brazil? This is Empire. Welcome to Empire. I am Marwan Bishara, here in the Brazilian capital, where the leaders of Brazil, Russia, India, and China have convened their second summit, the so-called BRICS summit, where they've reached some important bilateral deals and underlined their commitment to multilateral global leadership. Considering they make up 40% of the world population, 26% of its territory, and almost 15% of its gross domestic product, the world, the United States, and indeed the West need to pause and pay attention. It was the moment when the most influential man on the planet met the other guy. For more than 60 years, global power lived here, was measured in these, and enforced like this. Not anymore. I think American administration is quite honestly is finished. The general trend towards definitely is away from Washington and towards Beijing, towards Brasilia, towards Delhi. Today the reins of geopolitical power are shifting towards countries that were once beggars at America's gate. Brazil. Brazil, Russia, India and China have a fundamental role to play in the construction of the new international order, which is more fair, representative and secure. Hi, this is Jim O'Neill. I'm head of global economics research at Goldman Sachs. The BRIC alliance was originally no more than a snappy title, dreamt into existence by a Western economist. I did it on the back of 9-11 and the message was, if the world is going to thrive, globalization cannot be... Americanization. Within a few short years, the dream became reality as Brazil, Russia, India and China formed an informal partnership based on collective hard and soft power. Four out of every ten people in the world live in the BRIC countries. Their individual gross domestic product is pushing them up the ranking of global economic giants. And their individual military might gives them a collective strategic strength. It's the world turned upside down. The US is certainly not going to be anywhere near as dominant in the next coming decade, and the BRIC countries are all critical to the future of the world. As the Western world slumped into recession, the emerging economies were booming. They seized their chance to topple the world giant and shift the geopolitical axis eastward and southward. So far, Whenever there was recession in the world, it was brought about by the USA economy, and it was the USA which pulled the world out of the recession. But this time, which country is bringing the world out of recession? China. Now, while America stays at home, with the government's credit card maxed out on foreign wars, China has been on a global buying spree, gobbling up vital resources across Africa, and supplanting Washington as the number one customer for Saudi oil. The BRIC countries are now demanding their voices be heard in the organizations set up by Washington to run the world. We support a multipolar, equitable, democratic and just world order. Brazil, which once begged for cash from the IMF, 
has loaned $10 billion to the fund and called for an end to American dominance of its structures. Each country will give money proportional to its reserves, and Brazil cannot be left out. And led by China, which has propped up the failing American economy by buying nearly $3 trillion of U.S. government debt, the BRIC countries are demanding an alternative to the dollar as the world's official reserve currency. Both China and Brazil are willing to push for reform of the global financial system. If you look at all of these organizations, they're all remnants of... Uh, of World War II or the post-World War II order. The main benefit that I observe of them meeting and pronouncing together is that it should embarrass uh, the US and the G7 members and the heads of the IMF and other you know, true global organizations to get off the backsides and get a move on with making our global organizations more representative. <laughs> BRIC isn't a coherent global power block, more a marriage of convenience centered on a series of strong regional power bases in Beijing and Sao Paulo, Moscow and Mumbai. Its ultimate aim is to ensure that no single nation will ever again hold the reins of world power solely in its hands. They want four or six powers. They are not always exactly equal but you know, powerful enough in their regions and so on and so forth to constantly balance each other. But do the BRIC nations really want to remold the very structure of the world or simply want a bigger share of the existing one? And if the geopolitical sun is rising in the east, is it finally setting on the west? Foreign Minister, thank you for welcoming us here at the uh, Palace Itamaricha, I believe. Yes. Indeed, it's a pleasure coming, uh, welcoming you. And welcome to Empire. It's a pleasure also. I sense that you've chaired a magnificent summit. It's an impressive gathering. And the communique reads with flowery and magnificent bombastic language. But with one problem, for a Minister, there's nothing concrete in it except that China is going to be the next host of the next summit. Well, you know, people are always asking what is, it, what is there of concrete in these uh, summits. And I believe, uh, first of all, in the case of BRICS, the fact itself that it took place for the second time in two years' time at summit level is already a very important fact because these are countries that were not used to talk to one another. <laughs> Actually, the BRICS, in a way, was not even created by us. It was a discovery. If right. It's not an invention, but a discovery of the financial analysts. So we had the first summit last year in Ekaterinburg. This is the second summit. It is important. There have been meetings of ministers of agriculture. There have been meetings of central banks. There have been meetings of development banks. So many things are coming, uh, uh, which will happen in the future. We'll find ways of increasing our trade more than it has been increasing already, let us say, spontaneously. Right. Uh, we'll coordinate our policies in IMF, in the World Bank. Uh, in the Stability Forum, in the Basel. Uh, so I think this is very concrete. This affects people's lives in a very immediate way. It's not just building a, uh, a tower that you are, you are concrete. No, point well taken. But the, when the world looks from the outside, they expect the BRIC members who make up 40% of the world population, three among you, not Brazil, nuclear powers, to have more say about global affairs. Well, we are having already more say. I mean, in, 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 in the G20, for instance, the BRICS have already been able to, uh, to spearhead the change in IMF with the help of others. I mean, we don't want Very to... Very minor, alone. I must say. Well, minor, I agree with you. But, you know, the, the, to, see, to quote one of the leaders of one BRIC country of, in the past, the longest march starts with the first step. So yes. uh, we are not satisfied. But uh, I think that the simple fact that we are meeting, the fact that the world itself is seeing us as the engine for growth will give us more and more leverage to improve that situation. Let me tell you what the world perhaps sees more clearly. They see is that but this you have is... to compare with the past and with the kind of influence we had, which was none. True. And that's why a lot of people see this more as China and company, more than they see this as four equal num uh, members that you're basically riding on China's back. Well, 
China is no doubt uh, the country with the biggest population and probably the biggest growth. Brazil cannot have the kind of growth of China and will not have because the phenomenon that's happening in China now happened in Brazil some 30 years ago or so, which was a very accelerated urbanization and coming to the monetary right. economy. So this is, is a different thing. But Brazil is a leader in many other things. Brazil is a leader in energy. It's a leader in what comes to measures in, relate, in relation to climate change. It's a leader in terms of social programs. Uh, is uh, in many other aspects. We so power is not only measured by GDP or no number of nuclear, uh, nu nuclear Again, weapons. Again, point well taken. You also uh, hosted the IBSA summit with South Africa and India. It's, it's mind-boggling to me. Why aren't these two combined? Well, they were born in separate situations. As I, we already said, in the case of BRIC, it was a discovery by the by the international analysts. In the case of, of IBSA, it was very much a creation of diplomacy. It, instead of having 10 or 8 countries here, we have uh, three big democracies, three pluri-ethnical countries, one in each continent of the developing world. So if we're able to unite our efforts, uh, this will be an example of South-South cooperation. But there is no doubt that And we that have, British for instance, in the case of IBSA, we have more similar positions in relation to disarmament, to the debates on human rights, to the debates on reform of the Security Council. But does anyone listen to you? I think in a UN context, for instance, uh, IBSA will never have the same kind of weight that the BRIC have in, a, in the financial world as a whole. So once again, no, but let, why let me combine add, them? No, no, just wait a moment. I think the IBSA was created more or less at the same time that the other G20, the G20 of WTO, which was so important in the Doha uh, negotiations, uh, although they are not finished, but we had changed the course of the Doha negotiations. And this was basically an endeavor of the three IPSA countries, plus some others. So it depends where you are. In both cases, Foreign Minister. Don't forget, democracies, multi-ethnic societies, each one in each country. I know, you're keeping continent. the Chinese out. Now you're no, I'm not making democracy be no, no, I'm not keeping an important anyone, question. Uh, keeping anyone out, but just one in each continent. Yes. Here we have both IPSA and the BRIC countries. If anything is, 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 is common in between them, is that they both are formed vis-a-vis -vis the West, vis-a-vis -vis the United States and the West. In the end of the day, what unites you, or what united you during the Bush era, is more or less what is separating you or nuancing you now during the Obama era. That's why there is a question of commitment in, or lack of in your communique. We were not vis-a-vis -vis the West or against the West. But we are, in a way, both have in common the fact that somehow they question the established order in international uh, relations. You're opposed uh, to Western domination. No, no, we want to change. Correct. Not, it's not a question of being opposed. We'll be opposed to any domination. We don't want to make the BRICS and the IBSA an aristocracy to replace another. We want to work together with the other countries. It, there has to be a democratic debate. You invoked the word aristocracy. I wasn't going to do that. But in the end of the day, that's what you are, isn't it? You are we, a bunch of trillionaires, four trillionaires, <laughs> wanting to democratize the world, speak in the name of the poor, but you are four trillionaires. You're a private club of aristocracy against the hegemony of the United States and NATO. If I would be a demagogue, I would say we are the spearhead of the world proletariat. But I'll, since I'm not a demagogue, I'll just say that we are the engines of change in which more countries will participate. Today here, I had the presence of the foreign minister of Turkey. And Turkey is a very important country. It's not a member of BRICS or IBDAS, but it's a member of G20. And it's a country also that can have a, a positive influence in world affairs. So is Indonesia, and uh, so is Argentina, and, for a minister, I and so is Mexico, and I, so are many others. I attended your press conference with the Turkish Foreign, foreign Minister uh, Dawood Ugulu. It, it, it impressed me that it, apparently it annoyed you that you spent most of the press conference speaking about Iran. Because but of course question, I am the impressed. The question of Iran. But I'm impressed by your clarity on Iran. And yet, back to IBSA and BRIC. In IBSA, you committed and you said, look, we need more time for diplomacy. In BRIC, zilch, not a word. You have a problem of commitment. Well, we don't have a problem of commitment, but maybe you have uh, given one of the reasons for the existence, the continued existence of IBSA. In, 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 uh, in BRIC, we have uh, 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 two uh, permanent members of the Security Council that maybe have other commitments because they are permanent members of the Security Councils. We are still aspirants. On the question of Palestine, on the question of Afghanistan, I mean, this is now a 10-year 
10-year war, war, apparently it's a war of choice, the question of Iran and the threat of sanctions. Here you have three important challenges to world stability and security, and BRIC convenes for its second summit. Nothing, nothing, silence. Actually, what we had yesterday was not only two summits, it was six summits. We had four bilateral summits, uh, almost full bilateral in one case like China, because we signed 15 agreements and a plan of action and so on, uh, plus the, 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 the plurilateral. But the one. message in the end of the summit, foreign, foreign, foreign minister, there wasn't much. In a way, we are new kids on the block. So, the let's talk, let's, let's so we have to talk also about the new kids on the block. Some are yes. important countries, emerging countries, but in some respects, they have been in the nuclear club. They've and, been around the block. Well, they while. have been around the block for quite a while. Let's talk about the new kids around the block. Brazil. First of all, tell me, what's in common between you and these three Asian powers, nuclear powers? I mean, you're kind of the odd man out. Well, maybe we can bring some of our uh, soft power also to them. Uh, I'm not saying that they need, but you know, Brazil is a country, it's not a small country, by the way, that's already something in common. It's not small in population, it's not small in, uh, in economy, it's not small in territory. And we have not had a war for 140 years, so that's something brings, very special. Which brings me to the second question. I am baffled by the fact that a country that was born empire, didn't have a war for 140 years, is buying aircraft carrier and nuclear submarines? Well, aircraft carrier, for me, it's news. But Brazil has, uh, our, we don't have problems with our neighbors. Of course, we have differences sometimes, and we have to discuss the pr price of gas with Bolivia or the price of energy mm -hmm. with Paraguay, but that's normal. Creates a little tension here and uh, there. Oh, I don't think it's tension. It's, it's something that you have to discuss normally and take with, with great uh, uh, sense of normality. But... Uh, uh, the, but, but of course, Brazil is rich. The Amazon is a very rich region. We have the whole economic zone in the sea where we have the oil. But it's which not may threatened, be one of, is it? Well, I don't know. It's not threatened by anyone now. But uh, who can tell if in 30 years' time there is a war between two other powers which, and they, one of them feels that it has little energy and maybe is tempted to look it for somewhere else. We have to protect. I mean, you cannot, you cannot just... I mean, Brazil... I admire Costa Rica, for instance, for what they have right. done. No, I admire, I really admire, yes, I'm not making you. a joke. Of course, of course. But we are huge. We cannot just rely on the, on the, on the goodwill of, of, the, of the other powers not to do anything with us. Mr. Amorim, Foreign Minister, I, I hear you when you say these things. But at the same time, you open, what, 35 new embassies within four or five years? Maybe. I don't keep a statistic. You give $10 billion of credit to Africa, investments, and so on and so forth. You buy new submarines and you enter into new defense uh, pact with the United States. This is not Costa Rica at all. No, I agree. And I, I want to again be very clear, I'm not derogatory about Costa Rica, but Brazil is a continental country and it has to protect. Uh, but is it a continental con hegemon? Uh, uh, it has influence, of course. The uh, size, uh, si the sheer size creates some influence. But most important, I believe, we try to take into account the asymmetries so that the other countries will have uh, 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 more benefits than we have, which is natural because we are the most advanced one. Actually, uh, if the United States had done the same thing in the free trade of the Americas as we did in Latin America, maybe we could have concluded. But, but you know, we, we are not a greedy power. But I tell you what's of course, paradoxical. we defend our interests, but we are not a greedy power. But I'll tell you what's paradoxical about all of that. You spend so much money, effort and time on defense, on not on, so much, on, on foreign policy. Not so much. Brazil is one of the countries with the smallest percentage, big country at least, with the smallest percentage of expenditures on but weapons. But you also have almost a quarter of your population under the line of poverty. This is something that comes from the past and we, it's probably the biggest, how should I say, burden that we carry is mm. social inequality. Mm. But this is changing also. Brazil has been one of the countries that in the last uh, 10 years, not if I don't want to speak about this government alone, certainly about in the last seven years, mm. has changed radically the, the question of income distribution. Is there a lot to do? Yes, there is, but a lot was done. You criticize Colombia for its uh, defense agreement with the United States that has to do with airports and so on. 
You've just signed one a few days ago in the United States. It's totally different. The, the agreement we have with, with the United States is similar to an agreement that we have with Russia, we have to, with Sweden, we had with other European countries. It's, it's, it's a, a framework agreement that... Uh, there will be no American presence in Brazil? No American base, no American presence. I can, well, I cannot exclude that one American can come here for training or for a course or something like that, uh, but there is nothing, nothing comparable. There is no, nothing that is a base or looks like a base. For Mr. Uh, to, to, to end, I would like to ask you about the future. What if your government changes to something that goes to the right? Would Brazil then change its foreign policy? Would, it, would this look like a new Brazil on the world stage? I think the country is set on, on, a, on a direction that it will, uh, which has proved useful. Mm -hmm. So some of the business people who criticized President Lula for going to the Arab world and to Africa so much as he did, are very happy because they are also making business, making business with them. Actually, uh, in Qatar, the day I arrived there to invite Qatar to be part of the first summit of Arab countries in South America, there was also a company selling 500 buses. Yeah. Well, maybe it was a coincidence, but anyway, you know, sometimes trade follows the flag. So I, I think all these... And you also see, signed a free trade agreement with Israel for Mercosur last month. Well, absolutely true. I mean, we, uh, uh, which shows that we, we, are not, uh, we don't want to discriminate. We are not anti-Israel in any way. We are, of course, are pro-Palestine in the sense that we want to have a Palestinian state viable with the borders of 67. You have the Ibsa Declaration, which is very clear, couldn't be more clear on that. But we want that to be obtained by peaceful means. Foreign Minister, Mr. Murray, on this sobering note, Thank you for joining him. Thank you. Thank you. That was Celso Amorim, the brains behind Brazil's foreign policy. We soon need to take a short news break, after which we continue our discussion here in Sao Paulo, the financial capital of Latin America, with Professor Eldo Sower, who helped kickstart Brazilian negotiations with China, and seasoned Brazilian ambassador Ruben Barbosa, and for an Indian perspective, development expert Dr. Rathen Roy. But first, the Latin American editor, Lucia Newman, profiles the most popular, some say most populous democratic leader, Brazilian President Lula da Silva. Lula. The nickname of a leftist metal worker and union leader. Born into poverty in Brazil's rural northeast, who, against all odds, grew up to become president of Brazil. He has um, uh, taken the image of Brazil to corners of, of the world where I think Brazil um, was scarcely known before. Luis Inácio Lula da Silva was elected eight years ago, vowing to eradicate hunger in the country with the most land and resources, yet the largest number of poor people in South America. Corruption, poverty, and especially violent crime remain very high. Yet, with only eight months left in office, Lula's popularity has soared to a record 76%. Lula is a complete politician. He can uh, betray his uh, brother in order to get there. For the first time in its history, economic growth is being accompanied by a reduction in social inequality and unprecedented social spending transforming the lives of millions who live in slums. 20 million Brazilians, in fact, have moved up the social ladder, a combination of orthodox economics introduced by Lula's predecessor and social policies that create formal employment and ensure that children like these go to school. While much of the global economy remains in crisis, Brazil's business sector has never done better than under the leftist president it once viewed with suspicion. Mr. Lula for sure had a, a, a strong influence in this process and a fantastic and crucial role to make it happen. Few expect Lula's successor to match his high international profile. He's not frightened of stepping out onto the world stage, venturing into uncharted waters for a Latin American leader, like trying to mediate in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The wall of separation 
The separation wall has to come down. The restrictions of movement in the occupied territories must cease. He's also active in helping poor nations. We're looking for progressive answers to the unequal and dysfunctional globalization humanity is living under. Meantime, those close to Lula say he'll keep one foot in Brazil and the other abroad, working as a spokesman for the developing world. This while he sits out the next four years, after which, if he wants, he can run for president again. Welcome back to Sao Paulo, the financial capital of Latin America and home to 19 million Brazilians that best represents Brazil's economic might as one of the world's leading economies. Before I'm joined by our three distinguished guests, Professor Eldo Sauer and Ambassador Ruben Barbosa, as well as Dr. Rathan Roy, Lucia Newman introduces the country that's flying high when others are landing. Brazil used to be known mainly for its carnival, its football, and its Amazon. Now it's much more. In just a decade, South America's biggest country and the world's fifth largest has jumped from being the country of the future to the country of the moment. Brazil took it off some years ago to a new position in the world. And uh, from here, it's higher and higher. Brazil's state-owned oil company, Petrobras, may soon become the world's largest. Its economy among the world's top ten and growing. Rio de Janeiro. And to drive the point home, it's won the bid to host both the next Olympics and the 2014 World Cup soccer tournament. Enough to make the president cry with emotion. It's symbolic, but politics is symbolism. Brazil's dreams of greatness aren't new, as evidenced by its capital, Brasilia. It was built in the 1950s in the shape of an airplane. Brasilia was designed to suggest a country that, like an airplane, would take off to take its rightful place in the world. But despite its enormous size and wealth, until a little more than a decade ago, Brazil's flight, as many here point out, was more like that of a chicken than of an eagle. Now, armed with unprecedented political and economic stability, That's my man right here. the Latin American powerhouse is demanding to be a global player, no longer willing to be subservient to the United States. A country such as Brazil can no longer be excluded uh, from the decision-making process. So I think the U.S. has come to this understanding. Under leftist president Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, Brazil has finally taken an active leadership role in Latin America strengthening old and creating new regional institutions to promote the elusive goal of economic and political integration. All this without alienating the region's far left-wing bloc of nations, led by Venezuela's Hugo Chavez, and by keeping silent, at least in public, about human rights. We can focus on what divides us, or we can focus on what unites us. Even traditional rival Argentina is resigned to let Brazil lead. I would say that the rest of Latin America sees them as something slightly different. And in that sense, the sort of potential resentment for being so much larger and sort of the first isn't really there. But Brazil's ambitions go way beyond its region. It's trying to use its newfound influence to shift the global balance of power and push for a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. There's no doubt that this government uh, has a strong idealistic streak. Uh, but it's also very pragmatic. So pragmatic, in fact, that it smiles at the White House while winking at its adversaries. That could change drastically if the opposition wins October's presidential elections. In that case, Brazil would likely return to a policy of closer realignment with the United States. But no matter who comes next, Brazil has taken a qualitative leap, going beyond the samba and the football finally find a place near, if not at, the top. Well, as promised, joining me in the studio is Dr. Rathan Roy, Ambassador Ruben Barbosa, and Professor Eldo Sauer. Gentlemen, welcome to Empire. Let's get right to it. Your countries, India and Brazil, have formed a wonderful coalition of democracies called IPSA, along with South Africa. And suddenly you join in this new coalition called BRIC, along with Russia and China, and make bombastic statements 
basically aimed at the United States and the West. Why bother and join BRIC? The existence of this uh, group adds value to each of the countries for different reasons. Mm -hmm. So Brazil, uh, speaking in the world today, has the backing of a, a group that has a big weight in the world, economically especially. This thing started as an initiative from Goldman Sachs, as we've heard, about emerging economies, emerging markets. But you've become emerging powers. You have, in my view, three important issues. First, the institutional framework that was created after World War is no longer able to cope with the real conditions of the world. So United, we're talking about the United Nations? United Nations, the, the World Bank, the IMF. World Bank, IMF. Yeah. You also had, as a result from the Cold War, these different asymmetries with nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear nuclear weapon states. Russia, India, China are nuclear powers. Right. Brazil has nuclear technology. Now, after China started its so-called industrial revolution, mm -hmm. making a little bit more than 20 years what the other countries took more than two centuries to do, China is looking to get resources, especially energy, oil, gas, and also mineral resources like Which explains the iron. bilateral relations and the bilateral Between, deals with Brazil? Yes. yes. Dr. Roy, what about Chinese-Indian relations? I mean, there's certainly tension on that question. It's not as uh, much of a complementarity as it is between Brazil and China. The point about things like the BRIC is not to look at them in terms of clouds type alliances. These are countries that have come together or have been, if you like, forced together in an arranged marriage. And in an arranged marriage, you don't have expectations. You go with the flow, right. you see where you can cooperate, and if you cannot cooperate, well, let it rest there. Ambassador Barbosa, uh, do you agree or do you think uh, that such a coalition like BRIC will be able to rectify the imbalance of influence in the future between uh, the West uh, and the rest of the world? I think that uh, the BRIC is important because will allow uh, uh, a, a bigger cooperation among economic cooperation on, uh, and the cooperation on global issues uh, among the four countries. And uh, the weight of the BRIC countries rests on the economics of right. it, not on the political, because the agendas are different. The background of each country uh, is different in a perspective of 10, 20, 30 years' time, uh, the, the weight of the BRICS will increase. And uh, the only coherent uh, agenda for the short term is the challenge to the global governance. Uh, there you have a common agenda. So let me ask you, uh, how far can we separate the economics from the political and the governance? When, for example, one of the things on the agenda, at least as far as China is concerned, is changing the world reserve currency from dollar to something else where the BRIC countries play a role. After the crisis of 2008, which somehow faced out Europe and the America and Japan right. from the center of economic world and changed it over to China, India, and somehow to Brazil also, as governments and economies that were able to deal with this economic crisis, showing quite clearly that the instruments that are there today economic, financial, and institutional are no longer able to deal with the world as it is today. These three, four countries, in a sense, believe themselves, at least, at somehow representing also different regions of the world, say Africa, Africa. Asia, and South America, against somehow the hegemony yeah. powers that we are relevant and still are relevant today. Marwan, I have to add to this because I think this is very important. You use the phrase hegemonic powers. If the BRIC, there is a fork in the road here. If, let us take Security Council reform or reform of the IMF. Let's assume that the voting shares of the BRIC go up there, or for that matter, for argument's sake, India, Brazil, join the Security Council. The global community is going to ask, so what? Is the world going to be the same? Are these people going to get more elbow room for themselves and a little more space for the Paraguays and the Malawis on the global table? Or are they going to change the rules of the game in a manner that the global community that has collectively been excluded in the past benefits. So let's answer that. Is the BRICS mission in the long term changing global governance or simply getting a bigger share of global governance? Uh, the, the BRICS are changing. 
you have now China as the second largest e economy in the world, over overtaking Japan, is the number one exporter in the world. So uh, the numbers are very impressive. But what, what is important? I, at this stage, I'm not thinking about uh, uh, balance of power, equilibrium of uh, powers. I don't think that the BRIC is ready for that. What I, I, as I see it, the BRIC is important to each country because we are developing a, a, a common agenda of our own interest. Within BRIC? W within BRIC. If right. you think until, until now, India, Brazil, even Russia, because of the Cold War, the, the relationship was with, with the, the big powers, European and the U.S. So you have extensive links of cooperation in financial, in the financial area, in the economic area, in the trade area. Now, we are beginning and we, we, we hardly knew each other. This is a learning process for the four countries to define an agenda that it fits to its own, or their own interest. Do you think these countries are going to be able to present an alternative consensus to the Washington consensus? Well, today you have the Peking consensus, no? <laughs> Beijing consensus. <laughs> so well, uh, this, this, is an, facto, this, is, this is a new model that uh, is being developed, but I, I don't think that other countries in the BRICS are, will follow the, the Chinese consensus. After the collapse of Soviet Union, it, for at least 10 years, the consensus of Washington, those neoliberal prescriptions seem to have taken over around the world. But then the collapse of 2008 has shown that that was no longer the case and that everybody was kind of lost on how to, to reconsider basic fundamentals for, to organize economies, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. trade, the, the role of the state, the government, the role of planning. And then China came out as being somebody who has a particular political system, hybrid political system, with the hegemony of the Communist Party, but with economic relations as a capitalist but, but, economy. But that's, but that's not the Beijing consensus that we're talking about, and, right? Well, so China, and also Brazil, was able to come out of the crisis because it had retained some banks, some institutions, some companies, in order that it was easier for the government to organize the economic intervention and ease out the crisis. That's why G8 gave place to G20 in a sense. And that's why BRIC became important. Dr. Roy, uh, after all what we've heard about this complementarity between the Chinese and the Brazilians and the potential for, at least economically, this all sounds like uh, the United States uh, is, is facing a brick wall. It's like you've thrown a brick on, on President Obama almost. It's not exactly beneficial for the United States to hear all of this conversation. I don't see why not. It's a matter of any larger participation, whether it's in your household, whether it's in your country, or whether it's in the globe. Any wider participation in the long run brings good benefits for everybody. This is not just about countries grabbing each other's markets. It is not just about China's oil needs. It is also about how, if you look at things as a global citizen, people in the world can benefit from better intergovernmental arrangements. And you mentioned Africa. That's very important. It is very important in the BRIC, I think. It is not happening at this time for the Russians, the Indians, and the Chinese, and the Brazilians to have a dialogue on what they're doing in Africa, to dispel notions that what they're doing is repeating some kind of 19th century great game, because that is not the case. So it is very, very important, therefore, again, for these countries to think about national interests, but act demonstrably globally. And I think here the role of Brazil is very important because to, 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 to think nationally and act globally is something Brazil has done very well under President Lula in the last five but, years. Uh, gentlemen, you're being as diplomatic as the ambassador. In the end of the day, this is a zero-sum game. There are people who controlled the Security Council veto. They controlled the IMF. They controlled, through the Washington Consensus, the various global uh, governance, at least in terms of finance and economics. And now you are taking the show away from them. That doesn't bode well for the United States and Europe, does it, Ambassador? No, I, I don't think that we're still in the show. I mean, uh, you saw the meeting of the G20. Nothing is changing dramatically. I think that the BRIC will play an increasing role. But uh, I don't think that the BRIC will have the power to transform the world. I don't, I don't think so, at, at least at, 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 at this stage because there is not a common agenda. If you're speaking about the Security Council, mm. China vetoes other countries. 
Uh, if you think about Iran, the position is not the uh, same among the four countries. So I don't see, uh, on a short term, power coming from the uh, uh, BRIC countries to transform the world. I don't, I don't see that. Both of your countries, Brazil and India, probably have some of the gravest disparities between rich, between rich and poor. You think importing huge amounts of goods from China, you think that will help disparities in Brazil, or for that matter in Latin America, and places like Mexico, for example? Well, that, that's a huge problem. In China also, this industrial revolution, the economic system, is increasing disparity, even though not there, they're not worsening the condition of the poor, they're just improving for some elite, the condition. Oh, in China, in Brazil, China, they created something like 300 million China, China, new uh, uh, middle class. China but here, here we have a huge asymmetry in Brazil, yes. India, as well as in Russia. But, after but the it's not getting any better. In, in the four countries, there are uh, social imbalances. So Brazil, I think, is the, the, the better off of the, the, the four of them. You, you don't think things will get worse? No. no. For the poor? I, I, I hope not. not. But I think this well, is what also binds the four countries together. Rather than going, you know, all macho, as some of the, you know, people do about the brick, exactly what the ambassador said, these are countries which are still, each of them, struggling with their development project. India has a shameful record, in my personal view as an Indian citizen, on, on health care, and could learn a lot from Brazil on how to deliver better health care to its citizens. And all, but these are not problems peculiar to the brick. These are problems common to the developing world. But, but, but you are not normal countries. I mean, you are the club of trillionaires. Presumably, each one of your economy is above trillion dollars. You have how much? Two hundred billion dollars extra reserve now. Certainly, these are uh, you know, serious investments. Financing US <laughs> at the debt. negative interest rate. <laughs> the idea is more or less that you had OECD and G8, more or less one billion people around the world, consuming most of the resources and having access to most of the wealth. And then you come in with BRICS, which are mainly Asia, Russia, and Brazil, but representing somehow other regions, with the idea that this world has to be changed. Historically, India and Brazil are very asymmetrical. We have a huge imbalance. In Russia, it was built in after the collapse of Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. They're deal with, dealing with it now. And in China, the asymmetry is not that the poor became worse. It's that some elite is being created. Uh, Dr. Roy, You've been living in this country. You've been seeing how Indian-Brazilian uh, relations are going. Are you optimistic about this South-South relationship in the future? Totally optimistic and totally confident. In the summits, it was discernible that the leaders were determined not to be seen as a club discussing just their own affairs. On the agenda was Africa. On the agenda was South-South cooperation. On the agenda was how these governments could better represent the voice of those who are not represented in the global stage. These countries are countries of the South, and if they can deliver for the South better, then history will smile on them. I think that uh, uh, this South-South uh, cooperation for all of us is important and uh, should be uh, continued. But uh, when you look to China, to India, to Russia, the main focus is not the South-South countries, it's the developed countries. And I think that Brazil should do the same thing. In the last eight years, the, the priority here in Brazil was a South-South relationship, leaving the developed countries in the, in the background. I think that this has to be more balanced. So you think President Lula was more ideological in his South-South, yeah, not economical so. in yes. his approach? I think so. I'm afraid I, I normally never disagree with anyone in Brazil, but this is giving me an opportunity. I disagree. I think he was pragmatic, and I think Brazil's voice has benefited hugely from President Lula's skillful balancing of the South with the dialogue with the North. And I think China is learning from Brazil and will do more of this, and so will India. If BRIC is not to vanish and become a real milestone in the world, is if it is able to cope with the main issues which the humanity is facing today. And if these four leader countries are able to reshape the world, it's only if they are able to become a real force to change this situation. On this sobering note, Gentlemen, thank you for joining Empire. Our next stop after Brasilia, the political capital, and Sao Paulo, the financial capital, we head to Rio de Janeiro, where we'll be joined by filmmaker Nelson Hoynef for a stroll on one of the city's beaches. The last few days, uh, I got this sense of 
optimism in this country that I was told was never there before. Do you share the same sentiment? Absolutely. In many years at least, no. Uh, it changed completely. One of the reasons may be uh, the Brazilians have a feeling that they are more part of the world, that they are more important, and, and the answer is definitely yes, they are. Economic stability is uh, the basics for everything. So people can plan. I've seen, like I told you, I've seen this this place and the uh, levels of infla inflation that uh, just uh, could not uh, could not allow anyone to live. That's in past decades. That was in past decades. But now people was, feel that people they can feel, plan. People feel uh, the economics is good. Is the Lula da Silva government to be thanked for that? You think? or that's just miraculously happening? I think what happened on, uh, during Lula government is uh, to thank for that. That question of the poor and the rich in Brazil, the privileged and the destitute, how is that working out in the last 10 years? The disparities still exist, but there's no tension about it. They are not there's less tension? Much less tension. You feel that in the streets? You feel this everywhere. Nelson Heinoff on this glorious morning in Rio at the Copacabana Beach. Thank you for joining Empire. Brazilian city slums or favelas like this one, crime closed and usually violent, have long posed serious challenges to state and society. But that's not a Brazilian challenge only. From Mexico City to Mumbai, through New York, Paris and Cairo, Intra-city fault lines are posing greater security risks to states than traditional regional and international fault lines. Here in Brazil, that seems to change as the Lula da Silva government couples its security measures with far-reaching, wide-ranging socio-economic initiatives meant to improve life for poor and working families in these favelas. While there's still a long way to go, these policies are worth expanding and globalizing beyond Brazil for the sake of the world's poor and rich people alike. And that's the way it goes. Thank you for joining us from Rio. Until next time.